Father Fuentes was a Mexican priest. Father Fuentes was the vice postulator of the cause for Jacinta and Francesco. And he had unrestricted access to Sister Lucy. He had met her prior in 1955 on, on the 10th of August. He then met her again on the 26th of, of December, 1957. After his meeting with Sister Lucy in December of 57, he gave a talk in Mexico on the 22nd of May, 1958. His talk was well received. It was endorsed by both the bish his bishop in Mexico, Archbishop Pio Lopez of Santa Cruz, as well as by the Bishop of Fatima. It's important to know these things beforehand when we hear the whole story. Father Fuentes gave this talk in the words our Lady Lucy spoke to him. He starts off by saying, I wish to tell you about the last conversation which I had with Sister Lucy on the 26th of December last year. I met her in her convent. She was very sad, very pale, and emaciated. She said to me, The Most Holy Virgin Father is very sad because no one has paid any attention to her message, neither the good nor the bad. The good continue on their way, but without giving any importance to her message. The bad not seeing the punishment of God actually falling upon them, continue their life of sin without even caring about the message. But believe me, Father, God will chastise the world and this will be in a terrible manner. The punishment from heaven is imminent. Now that's how the interview starts. These words were spoken in 1957 and they were spoken before Sister Lucy was totally silenced. Her interviews were becoming less and less frequent and by 1960, even her whole old confessor, the Jesuit father, who had counseled her for more than 10 years in the 30s and 40s, when he came back from Brazil and wanted to see Sister Lucy, was not allowed to do so. Permission to speak to Sister Lucy from 1960 onwards was restricted to two persons, the Prefect of the Holy Office or the Pope himself. When you remember what Sister Lucy said in 1983, when the controversy came, did the Pope consecrate Russia the way Our Lady asked for in 82? Lucy said to the Papal Nuncio on the 21st of March, 83, she said, no, and I could not say so beforehand because I did not have permission of the Holy See. So she could not speak about anything other than what had been published in the books. And so she was silenced on the very topic of the consecration and on the third secret ever since 1960. She died under that vow and shroud of silence in 2005. So this interview of 1957 with Father Fuentes is very interesting because it's perhaps the last unrestricted interview she ever gave and gave freely. And there was no filtering, there was no changing it from the time she gave it to the time it was delivered. This prophetic interview was brought to my attention by Frere Francois 
Frère Francois was the author of those, the trilogy, over 2,000 pages. His book is called The Whole Truth About Fatima. And he said, Lucy, to the extent she could, was giving us the secret in that last interview. So let us examine her words carefully. Sister Lucy said, Our Lady is very sad. Why is she sad? Let us recall that in 1952, there was a statue of the Immaculate Heart in Syracuse in Italy. And it shed tears of water for days in Syracuse, Sicily. And it was recognized by the church as a true miracle. There have been since then many statues weeping tears of water and tears of blood even to this day. Not all of them have been recognized by the church, but as Pope John Paul II said, if Our Lady is crying, there must be a reason. Lucy tells us the reason why Our Lady is crying, why she's very sad. She is sad because no one pays attention to her message. Neither the good nor the bad. It's understandable that the bad don't pay attention. After all, sinners who have chosen a life of sin would not be too concerned about making Our Lady sad or paying attention to the message. But Lucy tells us Our Lady is sad because the good also do not pay attention to her message. The next thing she says is that the punishment from heaven is imminent, is very near. Now consider that in 1957, the world had just seen the Second World War, which was predicted in 1917, that would begin in the reign on the pontificate of Pius XI, The world has seen since then the Korean War. But Our Lady is saying to Lucy, to us in 57, the punishment from God is imminent. What is this punishment? She goes on to explain, but not so, you have to reflect upon it. She doesn't tell you explicitly Let us go to St. John Eudes and to St. Jerome, or rather to St. Jeremiah or Jeremiah the prophet in the Old Testament. Jeremiah, in chapter 3, verses 14 to 15, reports what God says to him. Return, O you revolting children, saith the Lord, and I will give you pastors according to my own heart, and they shall feed you with knowledge and doctrine. St. John Eudes, who was not only a saint, but one who trained the clergy, he deduces the following from this passage, that if you, the people, don't turn back to God, then God will send you pastors who are just pastors in name, pastors who are really wolves in sheep's clothing, St. John Eudes goes on to say that when God is particularly angry with his people, he sends them bad pastors. It is the worst chastisement possible God can send his people. This is the punishment that Lucy is alluding to that's imminent in 57. She goes on to explain without mentioning John Eudes, St. John Eudes or Jeremiah, she goes on to say, Father, Father, the devil is in a mood for engaging in a decisive battle against the Blessed Virgin. And the devil knows what it is that offends God and which in a short space of time will gain him the greatest number of souls. The devil does everything to overcome souls consecrated to God because in this way the devil will succeed in leaving the souls of the faithful abandoned. 
by their own leaders. Thereby, the more easily will he seize them. This was said by Lucy in 1957. It is quite likely that this is in the secret. In 1965, there were 455,000 Catholic priests in the world. By 1975, 10 years later, there were 400,000 priests in the world. That there had been an exodus, there had been a loss from the priesthood of 50 to 60,000 priests. Lucy was signaling this in her interview with Father Fuentes, that the devil would attack the priesthood and would get people, priests, to leave their ministry in order to be able to leave the faithful without their leaders, without their shepherds. Even to this day, the statistics published by the Vatican, even in the last year or two, tell us that the most priests we have is about 405 or 406,000 priests worldwide. The church has not recovered this loss predicted by Lucy in 1957. And the population, the Catholic population in the world was at about 700 million in 1960. It is now over 1 billion. So the number of priests per faithful has diminished significantly. Another thing to keep in mind is that the age of the priests is not, the average age of the priest is getting older and older so that in the next 10 or 20 years many of the priests just by the natural uh, age will be dying and there will be many less priests in the church. So we see the devil, if you look at the, if you take the bigger picture you see somewhat from Our Lady's point of view the devil's attack on the church and Our Lady sees it and she knows it's coming and she has remedies to tell us what we must do to save the church. Now I know that our Lord said and he meant it that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And we should be careful not to become too, shall we say, um, complacent in this promise. I would like to give you a few examples. For, for example, at the time of St. Augustine, who died in 430 AD, the Catholic Church was flourishing in northern Africa. Fifty years after his death, it was wiped out. Now, the church wasn't wiped out, but in North Africa, it was wiped out. And to this day, it has not recovered. 1,600 years later, so although the promise of our Lord is good for all time, it doesn't mean that the promise is good for everywhere for all time. This is not to say that if I had to vote for which country might lose the faith before another country, I would certainly not choose Brazil before my own country or the United States. But it's not a question of which country is better or worse. It's a question of the fact that you must be aware that the promise is not universal for everybody. The second thing we should keep in mind is that even if Christ is with his church for all time, and that is true, the fact is we also can become no longer members of the church simply by losing the faith. If a Catholic loses the faith and becomes a formal heretic, he's no longer Catholic, He's no longer part of the church. The promise doesn't apply to him anymore. So we should certainly have confidence in God's mercy and confidence in his goodness, but we should not be presume upon it. And we should therefore pay attention to what Lucy is warning us about, that the chastisement from heaven, heaven is imminent. And we have been living through this chastisement, but most people 
have not noticed. They've not noticed because they're looking for maybe a war or physical chastisement, such as a tsunami or as an earthquake. And certainly those things have been as well. But that's not the only kind of chastisements that God sends. And the worst, as St. John Jude says, is the corruption of the clergy. St. John Jude also says that when the seminaries teach heresy, as apparently they were in his day, and unfortunately there have been some in our day as well, then there will be blood in the streets. For example, I was part of a recruiting uh, effort to bring in seminarians in the 1970s. And one of the seminarians we brought in was a former professor of philosophy. And he has said that to his cardinal in Ceylon, he told him, they're teaching heresy in your seminary, and if you do not correct it, there will be blood in the streets of this city. He was not a prophet. He was only reading from what St. John Newt had said, and sure enough, there's been blood in the streets in Ceylon ever since. Because if God cannot correct a situation by, shall we say, less dramatic means, then God knows how to correct them by dramatic means. So these are some of the things that Lucy was alluding to, and they are in the secret. She talks about this and says, I cannot say more about this because it's still a secret. The Bishop of Liera could read it, and the Pope could read it, but they have both chosen not to read it, not to be influenced. Now when Our Lady gave a secret at La Salette, the Pope could read it, and Pope Pius IX did read it, and he acknowledges that he avoided many errors of judgment in his pontificate because he had the warning of Our Lady in the secret of La Salette. And so in these mistaken things of judgment, it's not for us to judge, but we can find that they, that they can make mistakes. And that's why it's so important for us to pray for our bishops and for the Pope, because there is a great responsibility. And as St. Augustine says, with that greater responsibility, they're in more danger. And so we need to pray for them more, as we need the prayers of the faithful to pray for us, as it's easy enough for us also to make error. Sister Lucy tells Father Fuentes, how much time is there before 1960 arrives? It will be very sad for everybody. No one will, no one person, not one person will rejoice at all before, if beforehand the world does not pray and do penance. I'm not able to give other details, any other details, because it's still a secret. According to the will of the Most Holy Virgin, only the Holy Father and the Bishop of Fatima are permitted to know the secret, but they have chosen not to know it so that they would not be influenced. This is the third part of the message of Our Lady, which remained a secret until 1960. She continues, I might mention, by the way, that when Cardinal Bertoni, you can see it on television for yourself, I watched it from the Italian television, it's on RAI Uno, and you can watch it by watching it on the internet. And Cardinal Bertoni op- showed for the first time the four envelopes. And on the two envelopes, as Chris mentioned, it is by express will of the Virgin that it's to be opened in 1960. Just something to know. It's not something we made up. It's We have hundreds of testimonies to this fact but the fact is, it's in her writing on the envelope itself. She continues to Father Fuentes. Tell them, Father, that many times the Most Holy Virgin told my cousins, Francesco and Jacinta, as well as myself, that many nations will disappear from the face of the earth. She said that Russia will be the instrument of chastisement, chosen by heaven, to punish the whole world understood for its sins 
if we do not beforehand obtain the conversion of that poor nation. I remember saying this one day to in a sermon in Edmonton or nearby the city of Edmonton and this layman was very angry. God would not do such a thing. Unfortunately, God not only wouldn't do such a thing, he does do such things and he has shown them in the scriptures that he does them. We have the example of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was warned by the prophet Jeremiah that if they did not turn back to God, that the holy city of Jerusalem would be taken captive. And the priests at that time said to the people, do not listen to Jeremiah. He is causing disunity. So Jeremiah took a a hammer and broke a hole in the wall of the walled city of Jerusalem and said, it is right here in this hole, in this place, that they will, the army will come through. Of course, if you've ever lived in a walled city, it is a crime to break a hole in the wall. But Jeremiah was demonstrating the certitude as well as the fact in making a prophecy exactly how they would be taken. And it's exactly what Jeremiah said. Now Jeremiah instead was treated badly because they didn't want to hear what he had to say. And they said, Jerusalem is the holy city. It is the city of God. It is protected by God himself. God would not do such a thing. But the fact is, Jerusalem was taken captive. They were carried off in slavery for 40 years. From 587 AD to 547, excuse me, 587 BC or before Christ to 547 before Christ. As you saw the Jewish rabbi on the DVD the other day, they were carried off in exile as a punishment for their sins. But God does not change if we will not take God's advice and seek his mercy. He will have to make an example of us for future generations. And so God had used the Babylonians and the priests said at the time, the Babylonians are much worse than we are. They're pagans and they have terrible practices against God. God would not use the Babylonians to publish, punish us. But it was precisely the Babylonians that were used. And they said, well, why would God use the Babylonians? We're better than they are. But the fact is that God had given more grace to the Israelites, just as God has given more grace to the Catholics. And as the Lord said in the gospel, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its savor, then what's it good for but to be thrown out and trampled upon? And that is what is in the third secret, according to Cardinal Ratzinger. In 1984, he said, Among other things, the third secret concerns the dangers which threaten the faith and the life of the Christian and therefore of the world. He said, Edunque del mundo, and therefore of the world. It, he didn't say about the fact that we are the salt of the earth as Christ has called us, but it follows. The faith is endangered. People lose the faith or don't practice the faith, they therefore become flat, tasteless, useless to God, and therefore useless for anything else, and are thrown out and trampled underfoot and killed. The dangers to the faith and the life of the Christian, and therefore of the world. And when there's nothing left to make the world somewhat acceptable to God, God chastises. Just as we see in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, when Abraham pleaded for those pagan cities and, God, and Abraham said to God after he told them he was going to rain fire from heaven on them, Abraham asked, what about if there's 50 just men in that city? Would you save it? And God said to him, yes, for 50 just men, I would save the whole city. What about for 45? For 45, I would do the same. 
for 40, for 35, for 25, for 10, for 5, he would save the city. There were not five just men in the whole city. And Sodom and Gomorrah are history. To this day, they stand an example for the rest of the world. So God will use Russia, we are told, is Russia he's going to use to chastise the whole world. When Sister Lucy was asked by William Thomas Walsh, Professor Walsh asked that if Russia is not consecrated, does that mean that the whole world will be overcome by communism? And she said, yes. And he asked the question again because he thought maybe she didn't understand the question. Father Manuel Roca, as a Portuguese citizen, spoke English and Portuguese. And he was there with Mr. Walsh. And Mr. Walsh asked Father Roca again to ask the question and say, and does that include the United States of America? And again, Sister Lucy said, yes. That was in 1946, when the United States was the most powerful nation in the world, the only country with the atom bomb. It meant nothing to heaven. God will use Russia as an instrument of chastisement, unless, and that's the big question, unless. And what is it? Unless we obtain beforehand the conversion of Russia. But how can we obtain the conversion of Russia? As I mentioned this morning, there's only one way. It's the consecration. There is no other way. And so it's in our interests that we work for the consecration of Russia. It's in our personal interest, whether you're American or Canadian or Brazilian or any part of the world, because the chastisement is for the whole world, not just one section or another. Now, someone might say to themselves, well, I am not the Pope, and of course that's quite true, and I'm not a bishop, and all of us or most of us here can say the same thing, and therefore what can I do? But the fact is, we're all members of the mystical body of Christ. We're all members of the one church founded by Christ. And by our prayers and by our sacrifices, we can do a lot. And all of us priests here in this room can do much more besides because we can explain this to our parishioners. We can explain this to people in various walks of life. Some of you write articles in the press, I see. Some of you speak on the radio, I know. And some of you have large congregations. It will not be something that is seen in the world, something flashy or which make headlines in the newspapers, but by getting the people to pray the rosary every day, getting them to pray the rosary in their homes, to pray with their families, to pray before Mass, to pray after Mass, to, it's been my experience that by praying the rosary every day is when I started to go to daily Mass. Now, it's not that I didn't know the importance of daily Mass, but we need little steps. We're all somewhat children we are all kind of weak. So we need the grace of God. And God gives us these little steps, such as a medal and a scapular. And from there, we graduate to the rosary and praying it every day. From there, we graduate to going to Mass every day. We try to run sometimes. We know what the goal is, but we forget that we don't have sometimes the capacity to run. We need the help of the Blessed Virgin to get us going. And as St. Louis de Montfort points out, even after we advance in the spiritual life, we still need to pray the rosary every day. I mentioned the King of France this morning, and the, uh, the thing is not just directed to the Pope and the bishops, but to my ministers. It is not explained that the priests are not included in that In that threat. Our Lord says, make it known to my ministers, they will follow the Pope, they will follow the King of France into misfortune if they do not bring about the consecration of time. So all of us don't have the same uh, weight or the same importance, certainly as the bishops or the Pope, but all of us can do something to bring about that consecration. 
as I say, if nothing else, by getting a campaign, a crusade of the rosary. There have been, in our own time, even in this country, in 1964, if I recall, the government changed because the women of Brazil were in the streets by the hundred thousands praying the rosary. We had on the DVD yesterday Father Hess from Austria explaining that in his country for 10 years there was a crusade of the rosary. Teresa Neumann said she was an, a mystic, she had the stigmata, and she died in 1961. And she said it was because 10% of the faithful in Austria prayed the rosary every day that the Russian armies left Austria in 1955. Now, if you remember current events, I was growing up at the time and reading newspapers avidly. I don't do that anymore. But in 55 and 56, you saw the Polish uprising, I think it was in 55, and we have a priest here from Poland who can tell you more about it, I'm sure, than I can. And in 56, and I knew some uh, of the people, I went to Hungary in 71, and the slaughter of the faithful and of the, of the citizens in Hungary and Pol Poland was quite cruel and quite oppressive. In 71, when I was there, you could still see lineups for people to buy their bread. When we held a rosary up in front of the statue in 71, there were two Russian soldiers a few minutes, a few steps away, and my Hungarian guide said, tell your friend to take that down or they will throw me in jail. He said, I don't have my children baptized because if I do, I will lose my job. When we crossed into the border in 71, you had the, the army changing guard three at a time. And as one of us was explained, explained, it's because they don't trust anybody. They, each one is watching the other two guards that they don't run. And the, the watchtowers and the barbed wire were quite in evidence. And the fields were plowed up for miles and a big stretch of them so anyone could be seen running. This is the paradise they told us everyone would want to be in, but they were locked in. At the same time, in 55, as the suppression of the Hungarian uprising and the Polish uprising, the Austrians had the Russian armies leave without a sh shot being fired, without a drop of blood being shed because 10% of the people of that country were praying the rosary every day. The power of the rosary is its a simple thing. It looks like it's unimportant, but in fact is it is more powerful than guns or bombs. It is more powerful than kings and emperors. As it says in sacred scripture, the heart of the king is in the hand of God. So God can change the heart of whether it's the king or the president or the Soviet Politburo, whoever he wants, he can change their heart. And by the grace of God, through the intercession of Our Lady, we can obtain those things. Now in 1951, Pope Pius XII told us in his encyclical Evangelii Preconis, on 2nd of June, 51, he said, quote, the world today is worse now than before the flood. In 1951, he said that. And that was before we had legalized, so-called legalized abortion, legalized homosexuality, legalized pornography, legalized contraception and divorce and so forth. What would he possibly say about our world today? If the world was worse in 51 than before the time of the deluge, the time of Noah and his family and all the rest of the mankind being drowned in the great flood. What is it like today, 50 years later? It's hard for us because we're so close to the situation. I speak for myself and I believe it's the same for you. That because we have been born into this world at this time, it's hard for us to get some sense of proportion. But if you look at the facts, Pius XII was not exaggerating. There's been never a time in history that we've been killing 50 million babies around the world every year. 
There are four sins that cry to heaven for vengeance. One of them is the killing, the shedding of innocent blood. Killing 50 million babies every year certainly cries to heaven for vengeance. Another sin that cries to heaven, there's many, there's thousands of sins, but the Bible tells us there are four that cry to heaven for vengeance. Another sin which is quite popular today and legalized is homosexuality. That also draws down God's wrath upon mankind. And it's practiced widely and it is justified. You know, in the oath of office for a bishop, at least in the old rite, the bishop was reminded not to call good evil or to call evil good. It comes from sacred scripture. Calling evil good and good evil is worse than hypocrisy. The hypocrite at least knows what is good and pretends to be that good person. But the person who calls evil good and glories in being evil is more perverse still. And we have these people, as St. John Chrysostom points out, there are two kinds of hardened sinners he talks about, the prostitute and the homosexual. They have hardened their conscience so much that they have lost all shame. Not only that, they justify it and say that they're doing good. And we're living in that day today, at least in my country, where it is illegal It's a hate crime to denounce homosexuality. That is how perverse not only they are, but the fact that the rest of the country puts up with this. And in my country, in which the prime minister calls an emergency session of parliament, it's like there was a war going on or something. The last time he called an emergency session was in 1970 in a hostage-taking crisis with terrorists. He calls an emergency session of parliament to pass the legalization of homosexuality. And my countrymen, for the most part, are brain dead. They don't get it. If we were a bit more zealous, a bit more spiritual, a bit more prayerful, a bit more penitential, we would not have been so stupid. But it's up to the priests to shepherd their faithful, to tell them to do some penance, to tell them to open their eyes, to tell them to pray their rosary. So the fact that in my country, the people hardly react, there is a few people here and there, but for the most part, nothing. It's an indictment of the bishops and the priests, and quite possibly myself for not doing more. The world today is worse than before the flood. How have we arrived at this point among the clergy so that we do not shepherd our people? I'm sure there are many factors and I'm sure you could add to them whatever I might say here. But one of the things has been the poisoning of our minds When Sister Lucy tells us the beginning of the third secret when she says, in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved. It's clearly implied that in other countries that the dogma of the faith, and that's the word she uses, the dogma of the faith. What is dogma? Dogma is the doctrine of the faith which has been solemnly defined. So if we say to you that if someone loses his faith, if he denies one article of the dogmas of the faith and he knows what he's doing, he is no longer Catholic. If anyone should say that there are the sacraments of the sacraments instituted by Christ are necessary, are not necessary for salvation, let him be anathema, let him be cut off He is no longer a part of the church. 
Now, there's much ignorance, and we have to be careful that not everyone who says a heresy is a formal heretic. That is, they don't know any better. But the fact is, many dogmas are being denied either through ignorance or through malice. God knows their heart. But in either case, dogma is being lost. And with losing dogma, we lose the clear guideposts of where the, we are going right or wrong. Because if, we, if we're supposed to go to heaven, we have to do good. But how can we do good if we don't know what the good is? It is the faith that tells us what the good is and what the bad is. If we lose the faith, then we can no longer do, do good because we don't know how to do good and we don't know what good is. So the faith is primordial. Having the faith is not sufficient, but it is necessary. Now you have St. Athanasius telling us, quicumque vult salvus esse, whoever wishes to be saved before all good works must hold on to the Catholic faith whole and entire. That is the creed, that's the first line of the creed of St. Athanasius. It is a Catholic creed. You are bound to believe it as you're bound to believe all the Catholic creeds. And so we see that the faith is being lost, and how is it being done? It's being done by the very insidious attack on dogma. It's being done also by the insidious attack on the clergy. And Pope John Paul II alluded to that. It's in the secret, we can be certain. But he told us, He put it in much more personable terms. In 1982, when he went to Fatima to thank Our Lady for saving his life, to thank Our Lady of Fatima for saving his life, he said, among other things, can the mother who with all the force of the love that she fosters in the Holy Spirit and desires everyone's salvation, can she be silent when she sees the very basis of her children's salvation undermined? The Pope answers his own question and says, no, she cannot remain silent. What he doesn't tell us, because he expects at least the priest to know, what is the basis of our salvation? And the basis of our salvation, the bases, the plural, are at least two. One is the faith. As I mentioned before, St. Athanasius tells us, whoever wishes to be saved before all good works must hold on to the Catholic faith, whole and entire. The second thing is, of course, the clergy itself. As we are told in the Old Testament again, the lips of the priest are to guard wisdom. And in the New Testament, in chapter 12 of the Apocalypse, verses 3 and 4, we are told that the tail of the dragon, and by the way, John Paul II quoted this chapter verse also in the year 2000 in his, in, his, in his homily at Fatima. He said that the message of Fatima is a divine warning to be on our guard against the tail of the dragon that drags down one-third of the stars of heaven. Again, he does not explain who these, what or who these stars of heaven are, but you can find it in standard in, uh, books on, of analysis of the scripture. I can quote you one in English, Father Bernard Kramer, published in 1956. He takes every verse of, the, of that book of the Apocalypse and tells you what it means. You go to chapter 12, verse 3, the stars of heaven. Well, let us examine what is a star. What does it do? A star shows a sailor his port, how to get home. Before the days of radar and other things, 
you could depend on the stars to tell you where you were if you know how to read them on the sea. The stars of heaven are the stars that show you your way home to heaven. And who are one of those stars but the Catholic clergy? They are the ones who show you your way home to heaven. It refers to yourselves, dear fathers and excellencies. It tells us in the apocalypse that we are living through that time now. John Paul II tells us we're living in that time. It's in the secret that we must be on our guard against the third of the stars of heaven who are at the service of the devil. Someone yesterday mentioned to me that I didn't give enough scriptural quotes. I hope I'm making up for it today. It is modernism, the heresy of modernism, that St. Pius X, the last pope to be canonized, tells us is the accumulation of all heresies. Modernism is a sewer, he calls it, of all heresies. And modernism is what is infecting dogma and the mind of the Catholic clergy today. It's easy enough to breathe this in, just if you go to some sort of place where there's lots of uh, some contagious disease, you might catch it by being near somebody. Well, there's also the diseases of the mind. There's the diseases of the faith. Heresy is also contagious if you don't put your antidotes on. That is why Our Lady insisted that you pray the rosary. That if you pray the rosary every day, she will see to it that you do not fall into heresy. And if you've had the misfortune of falling into it, if you continue to pray the rosary every day, she will pull you out of it. The heresy of modernism is the most insidious of all heresies. There are two volumes written by St. Alphonsus on the heresies, a history of heresies. He died in 1791 or 1787. He did not see the worst of all of them, which is what Pope Pius, St. Pius X tells us modernism is, is. And that is what is being breathed in in many places, in many books, in many seminaries, in many professors. I speak from personal experience. One of the tricks of modernism is to redefine Catholic dogma without even telling you. I remember reading the encyclical of St. Pius X against modernism on the plane back from London, England to Montreal, Canada. I remember my reaction at reading it. When I came across this particular trick of the modernists, which reminds me of the trick that you'll find also in the um, some occult books from the Middle East. I forget the name for the moment. St. Pius points out one of the tricks of the modernists is is to use a word like magisterium or use a word like transubstantiation or another Catholic word but to redefine it in their own minds not tell you they mean something else and continue to reuse the word in a new sense. And after a while if you listen to them and you don't measure your language against truly Catholic teaching you start changing your own belief system. What a diabolical trick. And who can resist it? So when Sister Lucy tells us in the 70s that there is such a diabolical disorientation, and she says in her private letters, among those who have heavy responsibility in the church, And she's very careful in her criticisms. She doesn't say very much, but it's clear that she uses the word so often that it's also quite likely Our Lady used it in the secret. So we have modernism attacking the minds of the clergy. Modernism itself attacks Fatima. The first rule of of interpretation of Scripture, according to St. Augustine, is the literal sense of the word. 
the literal meaning of the paragraph. St. Augustine says, you use that meaning unless it is contrary to reason or contrary to the faith. And it's the same with interpreting the words of Our Lady at Fatima. Take them at their literal meaning. I've yet to find them not meaning what they say. And unless they're contrary to reason or contrary to the faith, that is how you must understand Our Lady. However, the modernists would have you do something else. So, first of all, the first attack on Fatima itself is to treat it by the weapon of silence. To not tell you about it, or to not tell you it's important, or to not, or don't, but if you've heard about it, if you even begin to understand the significance of it, then they say, well, you don't have to pay attention to it. It's only a private revelation. I have disposed of that time and again, and if I have a chance, I will answer those questions or talk about it, but there's so much to say. But the second thing is to realize that just as dogma is, is attacked by modernism and by the, what shall we say, Occam's razor, or the, the denial that there can be known, that we can know the truth, that's the first thing that the modernists, the whole modernist basis of philosophy is the truth doesn't exist and if you think the truth exists, you can't find it anyway. And so it attacks everything. Everyone gets up in the morning. They believe that the feet standing on the ground will let them get somewhere. They eat their food every morning. They have not a modernist idea when they eat or they walk or they do other things. But when it comes to the things of God, all of a sudden the switch goes on. And we know nothing. Or anything we do learned before, we can forget, and there's no punishment. So, Sister Lucy, back to Father Fuentes. I don't know what time I have here. Yeah, another half an hour? How much, how much time do I have? You can go for an hour. Already. My problem is that I've only got through about one third of what I have here. I'm told I have. Um, I thought somebody else was later. Actually, they started later. <laughs> we'll um, try and finish up as quickly as we can. Sister Lucy explains her own mission to Father Fuentes. She talks about that various nations would be annihilated, wiped off the face of the earth. But she says, it's not my mission to tell the world that. Well, if it's not her mission to tell us that we're in danger of being annihilated and enslaved, Here's what she says about her own mission. My mission is not to indicate to the world the material chastisements which are certain to come if the world does not pray and do penance beforehand. No, my mission is to indicate to everyone the imminent danger we are all in of losing our souls for all eternity if we remain obstinate in sin. She then goes on to say, we can't be blaming the Pope or the Bishop or someone else or my father or whoever. No, she says. This is the situation we find ourselves in and here's what we have to do about it. That is why now, and this is quoting Lucy, that is why now it is necessary for each one of us to begin to reform himself spiritually each person must not only save his own soul, but also help all the souls that God has placed on our path. The devil does all in his power to distract us and take away from us the love for prayer. We shall be saved together or we shall be damned together. She tells us that we are in the last times. This sounds like an exaggeration to our age. When we read the Bible and the prophecies of the Antichrist, we think of something else. We don't think of what's right around us. But according to Lucy, she says, Father, the Most Holy Virgin did not tell me we are in the last times of the world, but she made me understand this for three reasons. The first reason is because she told me the devil is in the mood for engaging in a decisive battle against the Virgin. And a decisive battle is the final battle, where one side will be victorious and the other side will suffer defeat. Hence, from now on, we must choose sides 
Either we are for God or we are for the devil. There is no third possibility. The second reason Lucy gives us for knowing we are in the last times, she told, said to my cousins as well as myself that God is giving two last remedies to the world. These are the Holy Rosary and devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. These are the two last remedies which signify that there will be no others. And the third reason Lucy gives us is one of her own reasoning, which goes as follows. Because in the plans of divine providence, God always, before he's about to chastise the world, exhausts all other remedies. Now when he sees that the world pays no attention whatsoever, then as we say in our imperfect manner of speaking, he offers with a certain trepidation, with a certain fearfulness, the last means of salvation his most holy mother. It is with a certain fearfulness, a certain trepidation, because if you despise and repulse this ultimate means, we will have no more forgiveness from heaven, because we will have committed a sin which the gospel calls the sin against the Holy Spirit. This sin consists of openly rejecting with full knowledge and consent the salvation which he offers. Let us remember that Jesus Christ is a very good son, and he does not permit that we offend and despise his most holy mother. Lucy continues, We have recorded through many centuries of the church history the obvious testimony which demonstrates by terrible chastisements which have befallen those who have attacked the honor of his most holy mother. How the holy, how our Lord Jesus Christ is always defends the honor of his mother. The Statue, the picture of Our Lady Chostakova, if you look at the slashes in her cheek, you may not know why they're there, but a soldier to show his disrespect and hatred of Our Lady cut her cheek twice with his sword and he fell dead instantly afterwards. That's just an example of how God defends his mother. Finally, Sister Lucy told me, Father Fonte said, that there are two means to save the world, prayer and sacrifice. Regarding the Holy Rosary, Lucy said, look, Father, the most holy virgin in these last times in which we live has given a new efficacy to the recitation of the Rosary to such an extent that there's no problem, no matter how difficult, whether in temporal or above all spiritual, in the personal life of each one of us, of our families, of the families of the world, of the religious communities, or even the life of peoples and nations that cannot be solved by the rosary. There is no problem, I tell you, no matter how difficult it is, that we cannot resolve by the prayer of the Holy Rosary. With the Holy Rosary, we will save ourselves, we will sanctify ourselves, and we will console our Lord and obtain the salvation of many souls. At the end of this interview, Sister Lucy speaks about the devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. She says to Father Fuentes, Finally, the devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, our Most Holy Mother, consists of considering her as a seat of mercy, of goodness, and of pardon, and as a certain door by which we are to enter heaven. Uh, John tells me I'm out of time here. I would just like to tell you that Father Fuentes, after this, was attacked and called a liar in public by an anonymous note from the Diocese of of the Chancery Office of Coimbra. This anonymous note to this day, some almost 50 years later, no one has ever said who wrote this note. My father explained to me that if someone is not willing to sign a letter, he would not read it, because if no one is going to take responsibility for what they write, why should I take the responsibility of reading it? It's a purpose, it's a principle of both Catholic law and the natural law that all legislators take personal responsibility for what they say. And all, all persons in executive position take responsibility for what they order. An anonymous note 
in church law as in civil law is useless. However, just as whispers that say, don't say so-and-so said this are useless, the fact is most people don't apply themselves. They do not think that this person who whispers to me this or that lie, this or that story, who is not willing to take responsibility for what he says, if you fall into that trap, you become part of the problem because you have not held people accountable. Similarly, Father Fuentes was considered then a liar for many years, but Father Alfonso Alonso in 1975 first accepted the lies, but then he said, I've studied the matter more thoroughly. What Father, Alonso, what Father Fuentes said is true, and in fact, what he said in this interview with Sister Lucy is not as strong as things she said other places. So this Father Fuentes interview is a very significant interview. It is combated, but nevertheless, it has been vindicated by any scholar who studies the matter, and it's something for us to take to heart today. And even the very fact that what she predicted through Father Fuentes in 57 was realized by 1975, it speaks for itself.